So tonight's presentation is going to be by Cheryl Mack, uh, as I mentioned before. And pardon me as I read part of this because I don't have it memorized. But uh, she uh, did receive her master's degree in anthropology from the University of Oregon and uh, worked as an archaeologist in the Columbia River Gorge in 1979, assisting with salvage excavations. Um, and the majority of her career was spent as an archaeologist for the Gifford Pinchot National Forest in Southwest Washington, from which she retired in 2011 after 31 years. So anyway, Cheryl, let's uh, get this turned over to you and hear what everybody came for. Okay, well, thank you. Let's see if this will work here. Oh. Uh, see if I can stop the video. I'm trying to. Okay, there we go. How does that look? Looks great. Okay. All right. Well, this is an updated version of a presentation that I gave to OAS in 2009. Um, but we have several new sites to talk about and updated analysis results. But if you saw that earlier presentation, some of this is going to look familiar. So the area that I'll be talking about lies to the southwest of Mount Adams, um, mostly in Skamania County, Washington, and on lands that are administered by the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. So this area falls within the traditional territory of a number of tribes and bands that today are part of the Yakima Nation. So this includes the Yakima, the Klickitat, uh, the Wishram and the Cascade people. So this area would have been considered upland territory due to its elevation. And it was one that was primarily used uh, in summer and fall for things like berry picking, plant gathering and hunting. So this area contains hundreds of lava tube caves. So these sometimes lengthy lava tubes, they can be thousands of feet long. They tend on the whole to maintain a, a fairly constant low temperature, so around 45 degrees average. And they tend to be damp uh, even in the summertime because water percolates through the, the porous uh, basalt. So in other words, not entirely conducive to use by people. But people have used these caves through time uh, for a variety of purposes. So there's one lava tube on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest where portions of the uh, ceiling have collapsed leaving open arches, which provided shelter. So this cave contained fire hars, um, and it contained um, areas which were cleared of rocks and soil was brought in to level them. You can see these all labeled here as, as features, and also um, past brownstone tools. Now, charcoal from the fire hearth was dated to about 1500 years ago. So we've also documented several sites where habitation was centered around lava tube openings, around the cave openings. And it's possible that the caves were being used as a source of drinking water and possibly as a temporary storage area for perishable foods. So the 1853 journals of the McClellan um, Railroad Survey Expedition mentioned caves and they state that their Indian guide told them that it was a source of drinking water. So non-Indian settlers in the uh, Trout Lake Valley readily acknowledged the value of these caves in the late 1800s as a commercial source of ice in the case of the ice cave here, and also as a place to make and store butter and cheese. And I love this. This is a label from the 1940s uh, for the rope for cheese that they made uh, in the cheese cave, which is here in Trout Lake. So, Several of these lava tubes figure prominently in the mythology of local Klickitat and Yakima Indians. Members of the McClellan Railroad Survey Expedition um, recorded stories told by their Indian guides, now this is in 1853, um, describing how these caves were created in the myth age by the efforts of grizzly bear and mouse. And the early names that were recorded for the area around Trout Lake, uh, which include Huhupam in the Chinook jargon, and Lakaskni in the Shiskin, they translate directly as mouse land, uh, which is an obvious reference to these myths. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is evidence for a, a different type of use of these lava tubes. 
So three of the sites we'll be talking about were found decades ago, uh, between 1962 and 1979. So in 1962, a caver reported finding a spear point uh, in an unnamed lava tube that ultimately came to be known as Spear Point Cave. So he later donated this artifact to the Burke Museum uh, at the University of Washington. And I had an opportunity to um, briefly examine it in the 1980s. And it was stylistically quite unlike other form tools from sites in the area. Um, it, was, it was quite large. So I'd, I'd read a secondhand account um, of where the caver had found the artifact uh, in a caving book. And I explored, gone out and explored the cave for evidence of habitation um, around its mouth. But I thought that the artifact must have been an isolate, um, even though I had no idea how it got to where it was found, which was 76 meters in from the cave's entrance. So here's the entrance, here's where the artifact was found. And at the far end of a cave passage, so you can see how the, this is the ceiling height that they're showing here. So this is, the cave is narrowing considerably at this point. So in 1973, the caver reported finding an obsidian blade in a very small passage of what was then a little explored cave. This cave is now quite popular. Um, he reportedly donated this artifact to the Smithsonian Institution, um, but they have no record of it today. Um, I've never seen this artifact, and so I can only rely on the description that was provided in a caving journal, which indicated that it was found at the end of a crawl passage, very, very tight crawl passage, 80 meters from the cave's entrance. Um, and you know, so right about in here. And once again, I, I thought this must be an example of an isolated find that, you know, possibly lost by a curious cave explorer in the prehistoric past. So the third artifact had been found by a caver in 1979 in a very popular and well-visited cave, and it was found 250 meters from the entrance in what the caver described as the lowest area of the crawlway. So the ceiling height was about 60 centimeters or about two feet. So this artifact was reportedly donated to the Maryhill Museum, um, but unfortunately they have no record of it. It appears from the photographs that they took of it that it was obsidian. Um, and one other interesting thing about this particular um, artifact was that it did have some uh, charcoal surrounding it, which the cavers collected, but unfortunately they disposed of it uh, since that time. So we don't have it today. So since the 1960s, there's been a small and devoted group of cavers exploring these lava tubes. Most of them are members of one of several chapters of the National Speleological Society in the area. So there's an Oregon grotto, a Willamette Valley grotto, and a Cascade grotto. But in recent years, a small group of cavers have begun seeking out previously unexplored lava tubes. They want to find ones that nobody else has gone in before. So these would generally be ones that have entrances that are so small that most people wouldn't even notice them or want to go in them. And since 2001, these cavers have discovered 11 additional artifacts in nine lava tube caves. So most of these caves, as I said before, have very small entrances, which require one to crawl or squirm in order to enter. And I'm going to go through and describe uh, each one of these. So in 2001, um, while exploring one of these caves with a very small entrance, as you can see here, very tiny, a caver noticed a projectile point um, lying on bare rock approximately 54 meters in from the cave's uh, entrance. So the ceiling height at this location was, again, about 60 centimeters, about uh, two feet. So the point was a corner notch dart point. It was made of a gray microcrystalline silicate or chert. And through a series of connections, um, he eventually brought this artifact in to show me. And I certainly thought its location that far back in the cave was intriguing. Um, and the, the cavers make detailed maps of these caves. And I noticed that they indicated there was a large mammal den um, near the entrance of, of this lava tube. So they had cleaned this artifact and they had made a cast of it before they brought it in to show me. And so I cautioned them that there was information to be gained from an uncleaned artifact, um, specifically the residue of blood proteins. And I asked them that if they were ever to find another one to please refrain from scrubbing it. But I didn't really anticipate it was gonna come up again anytime soon. And again, I just wanna point out on this map, you can see uh, 
basically how far back in the lava tube uh, this artifact was found. Here's the entrance. So in 2003, a uh, caver called me to say he had found two obsidian points in another cave. So these artifacts were found 46 meters from the cave's entrance uh, at a place where the ceiling height was only about 45 centimeters. So that's just about 18 inches high, very, very tight. So these two lancelet points were found together, although one was partly buried in uh, sediment that had percolated in from above. And there was also the remains of a large mammal den near the entrance of this cave. So I decided to submit all three of these artifacts uh, to John Fagan at Archaeological Investigations Northwest. And John's a lithic specialist. And I asked him if he could do blood protein residue analysis and technological analysis on these three artifacts. So unfortunately, the blood residue results were negative for all three of these artifacts, but the results of the technological analysis was pretty interesting. So Terry Osmond and John Fagan noted that all three of these artifacts showed evidence of use. The corner notch dart point had been resharpened. Its base had been reworked following a break. I did once been a, a larger artifact. It showed signs of having been used for sawing, and it showed impact damage from use as a dart point. So the, the smaller obsidian lancelet point showed evidence of extensive reshaping. It was probably at the end of its use life. And it also showed impact damage from use as a projectile point. The larger obsidian lancelet point was apparently lost very early in its use life, but it still had a slightly damaged tip and it had a bending fracture at the base and which according to John, was typical of impact damage that occurs during use as a projectile point with either an atlatl or a thrusting spear. So in 2004, found by this group of cavers in yet another small crawl type cave in the same area. So this one was found 91 meters from the cave's entrance, again, a very, very small entrance, at the end of a cave passage where you couldn't go any further. So this 12 centimeter long stemmed obsidian point was really stylistically unlike anything I had seen from sites in the area. Um, and it was quite large. So later that summer, a Jasper Lancelet was, point was found in another cave. And then a side notch chirp point was found in another cave. So these last five caves, they're located within a radius of about two kilometers of each other. So a little over a mile and at an elevation of about 1,100 meters. So I had really harangued the cavers up until this point and you know, telling them that there could be other clues you know, along with these artifacts such as um, charcoal or bone fragments. And I really um, tried to convince them that they should leave these in place uh, for an archeologist to go in and document. So they actually left this third artifact in place. And uh, they were pretty excited over the prospect of my going in to document it, which left me in the position of having to crawl into a very small hole in the ground. Now, I've explored a few caves, but I have to admit that I looked at the size of this entrance hole and I simply said, no, I'm sorry, I can't do this. But after 20 minutes of encouragement, um, this is Daniela telling me, you can do it, um, I finally did squirm in one shoulder blade at a time. So, to enter this particular cave, you had to kind of squirm on your stomach or your back through a curving entrance. And then the cave opened up slightly to where the ceiling height was slightly over a meter. So the point was lying on bare rock, um, although there was a small amount of sediment surrounding it, which had probably percolated in from the ceiling. And I did take samples of that sediment. Um, and unlike all of the other artifacts found up to this point, this particular artifact was located fairly close to the cave's entrance. It was only eight and a half meters in, although it was still entirely in the dark zone because of the small size of the cave's entrance. And it was also different in that all of the other artifacts had been found either at the very end of a cave passage or at a point where the passage narrowed uh, to a point where you couldn't easily go forward, whereas this one you could could progress forward quite easily. So once again, John Fagan analyzed um, these three points found in 2004 for blood protein residue. 
these artifacts had not been cleaned and the cavers had gone to great pains um, to not handle them. And, but again, the results were all negative. Uh, we tested uh, in all cases against deer, bear, goat, and sheep antisera. So the technological analysis, however, was once again really interesting. So the large stemmed obsidian point exhibited a slight bending break at the tip and slight edge damage uh, along one lateral margin. Um, and John Fagan felt this was indicative of use as a thrusting spear, although obviously this artifact had been abandoned um, very early in its use life. It could easily have been repaired, made into something else. So the Jasper Lancelet point um, exhibited a slight bending break at the tip. Um, it had a finial that extended um, from the tip towards the base. Several serrations had been sheared off and the base was missing. It had broken along a crack. So again, Fagan felt this was damage that was probably produced during use and could reflect the thrusting motion of a hafted point, which was damaged on impact. So this would be a case where the, the base would have stayed um, attached to the shaft and this artifact would have ended up in the animal. So the side notch point had been heavily worked. It was missing its tip. Um, it exhibited a bending break and a crack. Um, exhibits crushing along the edges. And the, the bending break and finial suggested damage produced on impact during use as a projectile on the end of a dart or a thrusting spear. So I couldn't track down two of the earlier artifacts that were found, uh, the one from Mary Hill and from the Smithsonian. But we were able to borrow the spear point K projectile point from the Burke Museum for technological analysis. And it fit the same pattern uh, as the other artifacts. So similar to the, uh, the obsidian lancelet that we'd seen before from uh, Mossy Knee Cave, um, the base exhibits a, a bending break. The tip exhibits a previous episode of sharpening. And the bending break at the base and the burinations that extend from the bending break towards the tip and the tip damage are all indications of use damage. So the remnant of the base exhibits edge grinding, which suggests that it would then firmly hafted uh, in a shaft. And the bending break near the distal end of the haft element suggests that the point broke on impact during a forward thrusting motion. And John Fagan felt that this large lancelet point was likely the tip of a thrusting spear, which had been broken in use. So I also submitted the three obsidian artifacts to Craig Skinner, well then it was Craig Skinner, of Northwest Research Obsidian Studies Laboratory for geochemical source analysis. And he determined that all three of these artifacts um, originated from a source at Newberry Volcano which is a fairly common source for obsidian recovered in prehistoric sites on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. It's about 10% um, of the obsidian that's recovered. So Craig had looked at many obsidian artifacts in his career, but the projectile point from Ginger Cave was unlike anything he had ever seen. And that's saying something because as I said, he's seen a lot of obsidian artifacts. So he felt it would be worthwhile to attempt obsidian hydration analysis to determine whether these artifacts were actually prehistoric in age. So we knew we had no means of determining a hydration rate um, for these caves to get an absolute age since the environment within these caves is pretty unique. But we did think we could still get a relative idea as to how old they might be. So Craig felt that the fact that the caves have such a constant low temperature meant that they would produce a very slow hydration rate. So if you're not familiar with obsidian hydration dating, um, obsidian absorbs water onto a fresh surface at a constant rate, depending on a number of variables, such as the, the chemistry of the rock and things like temperature. So you can measure that hydration rim, and if you know the rate of hydration, you could actually determine an absolute age for when an artifact was made. Um, we knew we couldn't do that here, but um, what we did find out was that all three artifacts had very definite and similar hydration rims, ranging from two and a half to 2.6 microns, and certainly, according to Craig, indicates that they are prehistoric in age, probably somewhere in the range of thousands of years old. So 
I retired from the Forest Service in 2011, but cavers continued to explore these caves. In 2015, uh, caver discovered an obsidian point 25 meters from the entrance uh, of this cave at a place where the ceiling height was about 60 centimeters or two feet. Then later in 2015, a 13-year-old boy who was caving with a, a group of people discovered a second artifact in the same cave where the obsidian blade had been found in 1973, but in a, a completely different location. This is found here. The one in 1973 was found down here. So this basalt artifact was found 158 meters from the original entrance of the cave down here and at a point where the ceiling height was a little over a meter. But the point is you had to crawl through incredibly narrow crawl spaces to get to that point. So in 2018, an obsidian mark was found in a cave on private land uh, near Trout Lake. Now, I know very little about this site. I've seen some photographs. And what I do know is that it fits the same pattern as the other sites in that the artifact was found in a very, very, very narrow passage uh, in a cave that has uh, an extremely small entrance. And that's really all that I know about it. Then in 2019, uh, Caver discovered two artifacts, um, a lancelet point uh, and a scraper, lancelet point and scraper, in this lava tube, um, five meters from the entrance, at a place where the ceiling height was about 83 centimeters. So this site was really interesting to me because it was located very close to where a curious petroglyph was reported um, in around 1919. Um, it supposedly represented the imprint of the right hind foot of a bear in lava. Now, Bear paw petroglyphs are known throughout the plateau, and there's a large panel of them um, at the John Day Dam. But the reference to this print, which, by the way, has never been relocated, um, indicates it may have been more naturalistic, resembling an actual bear print in lava. So the few descriptions that we have of it from the teens and 20s place its location very near to this last uh, cave site. So this little excerpt here um, is from an article in the Oregonian. The geologist Harlan Bretz actually came out, um, he came out to examine a couple of different uh, petroglyphs, but he apparently examined this bear print and determined that it was actually carved um, and not an actual print of a bear. So again, just a really intriguing thing um, that just happened to be near this cave. So as I said before, I was still very interested in the cave sites. And so I volunteered to help document these last sites um, and complete the analyses. So I submitted the two obsidian artifacts to Alex Nyers at uh, Northwest Research Obsidian Studies Laboratory for source analysis. So one of them uh, originated from obsidian cliffs and the other from Newberry Volcano. And as I said before, these are both very, very common sources for obsidian on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. And then I submitted um, all four of these artifacts to Archaeological Investigations Northwest for technological analysis and blood residue analysis. So this is the obsidian uh, side notch point. Um, and John Fagan determined that the, the lateral edges of the point had been sharpened and exhibit edge wear. The tip of the point had been reworked. Um, there's a very small burination scar on the tip that extends towards the base that likely represents use damage. And there are remnant notch scars on the base, this is kind of interesting, um, that have been partially obliterated by basal thinning. So this had once been a much larger artifact that had probably broken and had probably been basally notched and was remade into a, a, a side notch artifact. So the basalt point um, has a very wide stem, exhibits slight grinding on the lateral margins, indicating it was likely hafted. Um, and one of the basal corners of the stem is broken. Um, the tip is very blunt, um, exhibits uh, use wear damage in the form of short bending and step fractures, again, which John felt was possibly from use. So 
The obsidian landslip point um, has a, a reworked tip, exhibits a slight bending break um, at the tip, and the lateral edges of the artifact had been sharpened, exhibits um, edge damage, and John felt, again, likely evidence of use wear. The so, thing I thought was really interesting, um, it had been extensively used on all edges and extensively shaped, and the, the shaping and wear extends from the ventral surface onto the dorsal surface. So this was kind of like a prehistoric multi-tool, you know, something you would have carried with you to use on all kinds of materials. It could have been used on um, plant materials, could have been used on bone, um, so a very, very functional tool. And the blood protein residue results were very exciting. Um, we finally got positive blood residue results from those two uh, chambermaid cave artifacts from the uh, lancelet obsidian point and the flake tool. So we got positive results for bear from the obsidian point and positive results for deer from the flake tool. Now this is two out of 10 artifacts that we uh, tested for blood protein residue. So a 20% success rate um, may not sound that high, but this is actually higher than our success rate with blood residue analysis for all our assemblages on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, which was about 16% positive results. Um, so you don't always get blood residue on every artifact uh, you submit. So finally having these positive blood residue results, like I said, was very exciting. Because up until this point, all we had was the fact that the use wear patterns noted on these artifacts suggest that they all functioned in a very similar way, probably as the tip of a thrusting spear or a dart. Now, the anthropologist Irving Hallowell pointed out way back in 1926 that the practice of hunting bears in their dens in winter was widespread throughout Northern North America and Eurasia. Now, the method he described generally involved luring the bear out of its den and dispatching it with spears or other weapons. And um, when I've read accounts for other um, groups in the Northwest, this tends to be the, the pattern that's described for, uh, for the hunting of hibernating bears. But there is ethnographic evidence that suggests that Indians and Yakima specifically hunted hibernating bear in their dens in winter and that they had specialized tools for this activity. So the Yakima Valley rancher, Lucas McWhorter, and it's, he's pictured right here, he devoted much of his later life to documenting the culture and history of the Yakima people. And among many other things, he recorded a series of stories about the famed Yakima bear hunter, Kwasti, who was also known as Samalee Sack. And he lived in the vicinity of Ellensburg, Washington in the mid 1800s. So Kwasi hunted hibernating bears in their dens, primarily to obtain their fur, but also their meat, which was thought to taste better during hibernation, uh, their fat, and their claws and teeth for ornamentation, as you can see here, uh, and their bones for tools. So he generally hunted in January, uh, which would be about the middle of the bear's hibernating season. And the stories that McWhorter recorded about Kwasti suggested that this was a very specialized activity and that only a person with great spiritual power could hunt them in this manner. In fact, Kwasti would say that he had, um, his, his power was greater than the bears and that's why he could do this. So McWhorter wrote that Kwasti would be armed with a heavy murderous knife a foot long. And in another story, he was always armed with a large and a small knife. He would enter the bear's den and after feeling for the location of its heart, he would thrust his knife deep into the animal. And in many of these stories, um, it didn't always go well. So uh, he didn't always have uh, positive results uh, with his bears. So bears do hibernate in these lava tubes uh, and they generally choose den locations that are within 10 meters of the entrance. So in fact, two of the cave sites we have of modern bear dens near their entrances. And most information I've read say they choose an entrance that's just large enough for them to enter with a short tunnel that leads to the hibernation chamber. The actual hibernation chamber is much larger, averaging about several meters wide and a meter high. And which interestingly enough, this is almost an exact description of the century cave entrance. The 
cave that I squirmed into. Um, so the artifacts from Century Cave and Chambermaid Cave, uh, the two where we had positive results for blood residue, may actually be from prehistoric bear den locations. And they may represent artifacts which were lost or abandoned during the attempt to kill a hibernating bear. But aside from the Century and Chambermaid Cave artifacts, all of the other artifacts were found in locations far beyond where bears would actually hibernate. But what if things went wrong? Um, what if a bear were mortally wounded in or just outside of his den and sought to escape? Might it not crawl back into the farthest reaches of the cave to die? So I contacted a, a retired wildlife biologist in Minnesota, um, Dr. Lynn Rogers, and he was a specialist in black bear behavior, particularly their denning behavior. I had read accounts of how he and other researchers would enter the dens of hibernating black bear to measure their vital signs. So Dr. Rogers emphasized several things about hibernating bears. He said they choose dens with very small entrances, um, barely large enough for them to enter, for protection both from the elements and from predators. Bears are very specialized hibernators and they're easily awakened. So it may seem odd to think of a black bear as a prey animal, but Dr. Rogers and other researchers actually feel that black bear have evolved their peculiar form of hibernation in which their metabolic rate lowers only slightly as protection against predators, um, which were primarily humans and wolves. So another point made by Dr. Rogers was that black bears are generally, generally defensive in their behavior and they will usually retreat when wounded or threatened. So he felt it was quite plausible that bears were hunted in this manner. He said he himself had felt the heartbeat of many hibernating bears and that they might retreat further into a cave uh, if wounded. So I also contacted Johnson Maninik with the Yakima Nation Cultural Resource Program um, a little over a year ago. And he and I described all of these sites to him. I described our, our uh, positive blood residue results. And he agreed that this was a, a, a likely scenario. So the presence of used and broken projectile points within these caves and the remains of blood residue from bear may well represent evidence of winter bear hunting practices. So just as Duncan McLaren and others suggested for the Haida Gwaii area, broken points might enter the far reaches of caves in the body of a wounded bear. Positive blood residue results, coupled with ethnographic accounts of winter bear hunting, suggest that these artifacts may be related to the hunting of hibernating bears in their dens in the winter. So all isolated artifacts in one sense, when you consider them in context, this type of site has the potential to provide evidence of a, a set of behaviors that are not generally represented in the archaeological record. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. I would like to encourage people to please put questions in the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, ask away. Well, I will ask um, or make a comment. I don't know if I could go in that cave. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. Even even that, uh, right, the archaeological possibilities that lie beyond, I don't know if they would even be great enough to get me in that hole. <laughs> it was a leap of faith, and I had a, a lot of encouragement. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't emphasize enough that the group of people that explores these caves, that it, it, it takes a different sort of person to be willing to go into these. Um, so, yeah. Cheryl, I was curious um, about the floors of these caves. Has, has the, the height of the cave or the depth of the floor or whatever, has that stayed fairly constant? It was a rock or was it uh, sand infill uh, coming in with water? Um, they're, they're almost all 
bare rock floors. There might be a little bit of sediment around them, but it would be like, it would feel like sand, um, the texture of it, because it did filter in um, from the top. But for the most part, they were sitting on bare rock. Okay. Um, and the ceiling height, I don't know if you've probably heard me say 60 centimeters, 60 centimeters, 60 centimeters. So many of these, that's about two feet, was the ceiling height where these artifacts were found. A couple of them were a little smaller than that. But, and you often, you, I wonder, is that like the maximum height that a bear could keep going in, you know? Because um, it's, it's pretty tight. If you think about what a two foot high um, ceiling is, you're, you're basically less than on your hands and knees. Um, getting through that. You're, you're pretty much sliding on your stomach. Looks like we had a couple come through the chat. Um, is there currently a system for cavers to report fines? Well, certainly there is. If they're finding them on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, we have a, a, a forest archaeologist um, stationed in um, Vancouver. Um, his name is Matt Mawerder. And he would love to hear about um, any of these finds. And also, I, I, I think the, the cavers themselves kind of have their own system for, for sharing this information. And they, they know at this point in time um, what they should do and who they should contact. So if, they're, if, whoever, if someone were to find something like this and they were with other cavers, they could um, get good advice from them. So. All right, and we had Anne, and she, oh, and she would like clarified. Now, why do you think that the points were deposited so far into the cave? Well, I, I really think that the ones that are so far back probably went there in the body of an animal. And then that animal, likely a bear, died. And over time, that body just dissolved, the bones dissolved, and all that gets left is this projectile point, this, you know, for the most part, broken projectile points um, lying on the surface. We got another question. Uh, can you account for the absence of bone if the bear crawled further back? So yeah, over time, yeah? Yeah, because we really do think that these are thousands of years old. I mean, we can't say how many thousands, but we do think they are thousands of years old. And, and Remember, and I talked about how damp these caves are. So they're really not conducive to organic preservation. In fact, we really never thought we'd get positive blood residue from them because of the fact that they are so damp. Um, so bones wouldn't last very long. So um, bones wouldn't last very long. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one. Was that a question or? Jim, did you have a question? <laughs> Yeah, hang on just for a second. I'm still figuring out. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Hello? We hear a feedback loop though. Okay, if good. Speakers uh, on. Sure. If you turn down, that'd be great. Right. I, I um, think I got, get, I'm coming to you now, but it, I wonder if, um, I think I agree with you about the depth of the cave issue. I think animals are going to go as far as the back as they can to feel safe. I'm wondering in the investigations whether they found any modern rifle um, uh, bullets uh, when they uh, in, were in these caves. For example, if a, if a wounded bear went to hibernate and died, would, uh, would there, there would be a bullet left over? Uh, kind of curious whether anything like that was ever found. You know, not, it's an interesting question, and not that I'm aware of, um, but, it, but it's also not the kind of thing they would probably think to bring to me if it was modern. Um, but the other thing is, is hunting, modern hunting seasons for bear um, wouldn't happen in the winter. They would happen in the summer when a bear would not be hibernating. So, so I think that's my voice I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 I don't know about that, but you know, sometimes an animal will uh, carry a bullet for a long time before he dies, expires, and that, it's and possible that, that you know, possible. he could have been yeah. pulled back into the cave. Yeah, but most modern hunting seasons, at least down here, 
our summertime. Bear hunting season is in the uh, deer, uh, The deer residue. Right, or spring, spring bear hunts, that's right. Um, uh, the deer residue, uh, blood residue, uh, that could have been something that was drug in by a predator, whether it be a bear or, or a cat or something of that nature. Yeah, and, and I, I guess I kind of a follow up question, and I'll get off the air and let somebody else talk. But... Right. Yeah, and I. I don't um, want to dismiss the, the I, deer blood. There's one other question I was going to. Oh, yeah. I don't want to dismiss the deer Right. How long do you think bones would last in a cave in a cave such as those with the moisture? Barely hundreds of years. Um, you know, we found, and and again, that's up here. You yeah, start talking about agree. Eastern Oregon, it's going to be very different. Right. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. You're welcome. Virginia, you want to ask a question? Yes, Cheryl. I, I remember the talk from, you know, 11 years ago, and I love hearing it and the expansion of it. And I can't remember if you responded to this before, but the ages of the opening and how consistent they are. Have they, I'm gonna recommend that Jim go mute. Jim King? I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Okay, I think we were getting that reverb. But would these openings have been the same uh, at the time you think people went in to uh, prey on the hibernating bears? Or have there been kind of dynamic solutions, you know, these caves opening up and um, being different? That is, the entrance today may not have been the entrance five, 6,000 years ago. And, and that is entirely true, um, particularly. Now, for some of these caves, it probably isn't. But for some of them, it obviously is because for some of these, the, the cavers actually had to remove some material just to get in. And a lot of times it's sediment that's percolated in. Um, so, you know, but for others of them, they, they do look pretty stable. So I, I think it's a, 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 mixed, a mixed bag there. But yeah, no, I, I do understand what you mean. And I think there, there has been, you know, definitely like the, the sediment that, that comes in it, it's clearly just accumulating over time. And, you know, these didn't have, these caves didn't have sediment in them uh, when they were created, so. So another quick question would be, would it be possible to put those um, uh, instruments in the caves to figure out what the uh, proper hydration rate would be there uh, so that you could get a, a more fine-tuned estimate uh, to get an age of these points? I don't know. Um, I I don't know whether that is possible. Um, at the time that we did the uh, obsidian hydration testing, you know, Craig didn't suggest that there was some way to do that. Now maybe there is something new that you can actually measure water vapor pressure and all that kind of stuff in a cave and and come up with that. But the other thing we wouldn't have is anything that was radiocarbon dated to calibrate it with. So, I, you know, we, we can measure, you know, temperature and water pressure and things like that, but we don't have a, a radiocarbon dated site, you know. No, I realize that, that it just seems like there, as technology evolves to deal with these challenges, you know, yeah. and that's the beauty of these records, people, in the, in the future can go back and maybe uh, use some of these technologies to uh, get better estimates, that's all. Yeah, and I, 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 I will check with Alex and see if there is such a thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not aware of it. And, and I did try hard to track down that charcoal sample that they collected <laughs> back in 1979. <laughs> I really pushed and said, you know, you sure you don't have it stashed away somewhere, you know, because uh, it was actually uh, someone from the University of Washington that had collected it in, um, in 
but he said he was sure that he had gotten rid of it all, all in that time. But I just thought, wouldn't that have been something? So. All right, it also looks like we had a few more come through on the chat. Um, has any soil analysis been done for increasing calcium at sites where the bear may have died? Well, all I can tell you is that um, I did take sediment samples um, from a couple of these caves and I, you know, I did do some crude testing to see if there might be bone fragments in them. I mean, and when I say crude, I mean I dropped hydrochloric acid on them to see if I got any kind of a reaction. And I don't even know on extremely old bone whether you would even get a reaction or not. Um, but there is literally, in, the, in this sediment, there was nothing that I could see. Um, but, uh, but again, that is something worth looking at uh, because you know, there were small amounts of sediment around, uh, around some of these artifacts. And we also had someone who would like uh, clarification on what tools, what the points were made out of, what stone. Yeah, and they, it's a variety. Um, uh, several of them are made out of obsidian um, from two different sources, uh, Newberry Volcano and uh, Obsidian Cliffs. And one of them is made from basalt, which is, you know, I won't say rare, but it's not it's not the most common source um, for artifacts on the forest. Uh, and then several of them were made of a microcrystalline silicate, you know, uh, something you call. Um. All right, and we have another question that says, since the obsidian source for two of the points were from Newberry Volcano, do you think these caves were known for bear hunting far and wide? If so, are there perhaps socioeconomic reasons why people would be going after bears other than just for food, such as claws and pendants, and <laughs> apologize. <laughs> oh no, there, there's lots of reasons that people went after bears because they, they did use many parts, and particularly their fur was, was considered very valuable. But the whole, you know, we have to admit that there were trade networks going back thousands of years. So this obsidian moved far and wide, you know, through through vast trade networks, you know, throughout the Northwest. So the, the obsidian coming from Newberry Volcano um, doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, the person who used it went there to get it. It could mean that they traded for it at the Dalles or, you know, something, something along those lines. But I, I do want to point out that there are um, sites somewhat similar to this in Oregon. And uh, you know, they, they have their differences, but they also have a lot of similarities. And so it's something we hope to do in the future is to kind of bring all of this together and, you know, put together some kind of a, a publication that talks about all of them. We have a comment that says, a possibility for the presence of deer protein residue is the hafting material like deer sinew or rawhide. And that's an interesting point. Yeah, I didn't really think about that at all. So I'll, I'll have to ponder that one. With, with the, the scraper, I have to admit, I know I'm not dismissing it entirely. And even if we had gotten deer blood on a projectile point in there, uh, it, it wouldn't have necessarily meant um, that it couldn't have also been used for, for cutting up a bear. But a, a scraper is such a, a a unique kind of tool in that it was carried around and used for so many different purposes, you know, and could have been used on so many different kinds of materials. So, so yes, it could have gotten, you know, bear blood from uh, any number of, 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 of ways. But I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is that that's more of a, a multi-tool than, let's say, that a projectile point would be, which a projectile point has a even though I, I noted that some of these had been used for sawing and they'd been used for lots of different things, but for the most part, they're used as projectiles. Um, and also, is this something being uh, found across the greater Great Basin area? Well, I wouldn't say necessarily the Great Basin area, but certainly the plateau. Um, and again, there are several of these caves uh, that have been found in Oregon. Um, and 
hopefully, you know, we'll be able to get some information from those sites too and kind of compare to what we have and, and try to see if we've got some kind of a similar pattern going here. Um, you know, the, those sites are different in a lot of ways and they actually have some intact bare bones in one of these sites associated with these artifacts, um, which is, and these are in much drier uh, conditions. So again, it, it's something that we hope to, to look at uh, here in the near future. All right, and did anyone else have any questions to ask? Oh, another one pop in. Okay, I read an article today about anthropologists who retrieved Masovian DNA from in a cave floor in Asia. Apparently this is a technique that is new and very promising. No need for bones. I, I read that same article and it was fascinating. Yes, I, I was like, wow, that's, yeah. So there is, you know, like Virginia had said before, there, you know, technology advances all the time and who knows what we will be able to determine in the future. Um, and it's all the more reason to, you know, leave as much intact as we can because uh, we might be able to learn so much more when we look at something in the future. Carol, you're looking at a specific type of cave, obviously, the type that bears like. I was just wondering if you had any analogies or anything about larger lava tube caves that related to this. Um, Not really. One of the caves I would classify as being larger. Um, it was the one found in 1979. It, it's, you know, even though the artifact itself was found in a crawl passage where the, the, the ceiling height was quite low, the rest of the cave is one you can walk through and the entrance is quite large. Uh, so, so that one is a little bit different. It's a little anomalous and, you know, and that's also the one where charcoal is found. So it could represent something different. It could represent someone exploring the cave and when he had to lean over and crawl the artifact could have fallen out of his pocket so um yeah it's it, we we don't know the last word on all of these yet i guess what i wanted to present was you know this is a hypothesis this is you know we're looking at the information that we have and here's a, a hypothesis for what this might represent and it it, it seems like it's you know kind of a interesting one it's interesting Interesting idea. All right, and you got a bunch of kudos too. You got an awesome Cheryl, a really interesting. And Virginia points out, your project is a great example of the US Forest Service actively working with the avocational organization, like working with divers. These groups want to share what they find. Wonderful work, Cheryl. So. Thank you for being our last presenter of the year, right? We don't meet again until next season, whole Zoom season. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I wanted to shout out a thank you too to all of the, the cavers who found these artifacts because um, they have been um, great fun to work with and they are always incredibly interested in um, what's out there and what this stuff means and um, so, I'm really grateful to the fact that they've come forward with this stuff. Well, awesome work, thank you so much. All right, well, thank all you. Right. Yeah. See you all, all right. on June 1st. <laughs> all right. <laughs> or Thursday, right? Oh, Thursday. oh no, don't, don't go there. <laughs> just, just to let everybody know, we hope to go back to OMSI in September, but who knows? Um, so uh, we'll look for information in screenings or um, the website will keep you informed. And uh, poor Sarah's trying to figure out, you know, a presenter who wants to present via Zoom versus one who wants to do it live and what are we gonna actually have? And uh, Julia Cleary's working with OMSI trying to figure out what, uh, what we can do so that we can put these on Zoom as the same time as they're in person so that people can have the option of how they wanna view it. So there's a lot that's up in the air, but uh, we will be back one way or another in September. So 
Thank you all for attending. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you very much.